thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm um, really grateful uh, to have the opportunity to present um, to today introduce uh, AJ Lowick. Um, firstly, I want to start with a land acknowledgement that I respectfully acknowledge that we are gathered here on the unceded and ancestral territories of the uh, Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish nations, and it's a real privilege uh, to be here today to do that and to learn about this extremely important topic. So um, just really welcome, and if you haven't had something to eat yet, please, uh, there's a few sandwiches left for yourself. Um, so AJ Lowick is a member of the Center for Gender and Sexual Health Equity Academic Advisory Committee and is also a SHRC-funded PhD candidate with the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice at the University of British Columbia. Uh, their research focuses on trans people's reproductive lives, health, and decision-making processes. Uh, AJ also works as an independent consultant, helping organizations to develop gender-inclusive policies and practices both within and beyond the health sector, and we're really excited to learn about some of those best practices here today. Uh, beyond sexual and reproductive health, AJ is also passionate about trans and gender-inclusive substance use research and care, and works as a graduate academic assistant with Dr. Rod Knight at the BC Center on Substance Use. Uh, today, AJ will speak about creative tra creating trans-inclusive reproductive and sexual health care. And uh, just as a note, our next speaker series event will be on March 19th and will feature Dr. Hannah Kia. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming AJ. Thank you so much. Is this microphone working and can everyone hear me? Excellent. I see lots of nods. So today we're talking about creating trans-inclusive reproductive and sexual health care, and this is an area that I've been working in for about 12 years now. So uh, I'm going to share a little bit about what brought me to this work and a little bit about my dissertation research. I want to re reiterate that beautiful land acknowledgement that we just heard from Shira. I think this is important not only to name my own relationship to land into this space, I'm a white settler, but also because if we're talking about sexual and reproductive justice, sexual and reproductive health, we ought to remember that um, we have done a lot of reproductive injustice to our Indigenous friends and colleagues, both historically and today. And also if we're talking about trans people, trans inclusion, recognizing that that is language embedded in settler colonialism and that not all indigenous peoples who we might kind of think of as trans will use that language to refer to themselves. That in fact there are two-spirit people who live on these lands who are reclaiming their own words to refer to sex and gender. And so to talk about trans inclusion is to talk about very specific people. The plan for today uh, is I'm going to first tell you a little bit about the kind of genesis of my interest in this topic, uh, originating with my master's thesis, which focused on trans-inclusive abortion clinics. I'm going to then talk to you about my dissertation research uh, entitled Gendered and Reproductive Becomings, Trans People, Reproductive Experiences in the BC Healthcare System. And then I'm going to use interview and photographic data from my dissertation in order to talk through some of the barriers that trans people experience in sexual and reproductive health care. We're going to talk about informational and institutional erasure, and we're going to talk through some of the dominant norms that exist in the provision of sexual and reproductive health care, including a bunch of normativities that I'll define as we go through. So I invite you back to 12 years ago when I was 12 years younger than I am now. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do with myself, but I was finishing an undergraduate degree and I was working at the time at a women's only abortion clinic, a job that I was incredibly passionate about. But I quickly realized that this category of woman was no longer one I could stretch to fit myself. And yet I was working in a space that was a women's only space. So this was a tension that I was feeling more and more each day. At the same time, one of my colleagues came out as a trans guy. He indicated that he would be medically transitioning using hormones and surgery, that he would be changing his name, that he would be insisting on he, him pronouns. And the board of directors needed to figure out what to do, because to work there you needed to be a woman, and yet suddenly they had a man as an employee. Ultimately, my colleague was fired, and the clinic decided that a woman's identity was required as a condition of employment. And I was allowed to stay because I can pass as a woman, which felt incredibly uncomfortable to me because I am not a woman. So there was transphobia occurring in this workplace that at the same time was saying that they could serve the needs of trans people as clients. This seemed like a huge contradiction to me and something that I needed to dig into. 
So I started questioning my colleagues. I informally interviewed eight staff members at the clinic and I asked them very simple questions. How many trans people have you served? And what does your care look like when you know your client is trans? Or what, what barriers do you think trans people might experience in the way that you del deliver care right now? To my surprise, my eight colleagues told me that between them they had only ever served two trans people, something that I knew was statistically impossible. And beyond names and pronouns, my colleagues couldn't imagine what barriers might exist beyond issues of intake forms, calling the person by the correct name, using the correct pronouns. They simply didn't have the competencies to imagine what other barriers there might be. So I, like the good aspiring academic that I was becoming, <laughs> applied for a master's degree, quit my job, <laughs> and engaged in a master's thesis project that was focused on identifying some of these barriers, thinking through what abortion provision should look like for trans people and what the challenges might be for trans people in abortion settings, both in, to, in and beyond women's only clinics. Once I finished my master's thesis, I pretty much just put it on a shelf and waited for it to collect dust, and I started my PhD, not thinking that I would do anything with it. But I was approached in probably the first or second year of my PhD by La Fédération du Planning de Naissance, which is uh, the Planned Parenthood organization in Quebec. And they said, we want to teach our abortion providers how to be trans-inclusive. Do you know of any resources for us? To which I said, there are none but I'll write you one. And so over about a year and a half, I wrote the manual on the right-hand side here, Trans-Inclusive Abortion Services, a manual for providers on operationalizing trans-inclusive policies and practices in an abortion setting, which is a mouthful. And the manual itself is a bit of a mouthful. It's 36 pages long, available in English and French, and it's been adapted for use across Canada and the United States. And I've heard of it being used in Puerto Rico, Argentina, Scotland, the UK, and elsewhere, which is a wonderful kind of act of knowledge translation and mobilization that I didn't even know I was doing at the time, but in retrospect, just sparked for me a real passion in doing work that is embedded in practices of change and action, doing research that actually does something, as opposed to writing theses that sit on shelves and collect dust. <laughs> I've created a learning module that's available for National Abortion Federation members on operationalizing trans inclusion. And I've also established a kind of one-stop shop consultancy business where abortion providers can come to me and I will talk them through their website, their intake forms, what their waiting room looks like, what their bathroom looks like, all these kinds of different areas. Um, and so if you need trans inclusive abortion services care, I'm your guy. <laughs> Which brings me to my PhD, the crux of the presentation today, now that you know a little bit about the nexus of my passion for this topic. I decided for my PhD that I wanted to expand beyond abortion and consider reproductive life more generally. I came up with the following research questions. How do trans people describe their experiences of care with the BC healthcare system regarding their reproductive capacities, expectations, experiences, and desires? What impact do these encounters have on the reproductive decision-making of trans people? What practices, discourses, or logics inform the procreative decision-making practices and procreative consciousness of trans people? And if you're unfamiliar, procreative consciousness is this idea that we aren't all kind of inherently aware of the fact that we might become parents one day. For a lot of queer and trans people, this is something you need to come to realize. And so a lot of trans folks imagine themselves as never being reproductive. And so I'm interested in what prompts someone to have that aha moment that this is a possibility for them. I'm interested in the role that reproduction plays in the construction of trans people's gender identities and conversely in the role that gender identity plays in determining trans people's relationship to their reproductive capacity. So the way that gender and reproduction are entangled, I wanted to kind of untangle that as best as I could. And then finally, what are the dominant narratives regarding gender and reproduction that trans people navigate in pursuit of their gendered and reproductive desires, recognizing that we as a society have very particular norms about what it means to be a person with a gender, what it means to be reproductive. And those come together and trans people are constantly trying to navigate them in pursuit of what they want for their own selves as gendered and reproductive people. So here's what I did. <laughs> 
I conducted uh, in-depth semi-structured interviews and engaged participants in a participatory photograph method, photographic method. I had 14 participants. Of them, 12 were assigned female at birth and two were assigned male at birth. I actually had envisioned initially a few more participants and I saved those spaces for assigned male at birth folks who never came. And part of that is reflective of the fact that I am a white assigned female at birth non-binary person and so there were some folks who were more comfortable talking to me. It also is exemplary of the fact that assigned female at birth folks have kind of a broader breadth of reproductive life than we often think of as imaginable for assigned male at, at birth people. Of my 14, 14 participants, six were from the West Kootenays and eight were from the greater Vancouver area. The idea here being that I wanted to talk about Vancouver, but also talk about folks who don't live in such an urbanized space and center. And I came into this with very particular assumptions about what health and wellness and transness might look like in these different settings, which I will tell you were blown out of the water by the incredible sense of community and incredible healthcare that's being delivered in the West Kootenays as compared to here, where we think of as more kind of utopian. It is simply not the case. Of my participants, 12 were white, one was mixed race, and one was indigenous. And again, here I had reserved additional spots for people of color, again recognizing that my own whiteness prompted certain participants to engage with me and others to not. The vast majority were in their 30s, although I had two 20-year-olds and one 60-year-old. The vast majority were non-binary and varied in how they mobilized non-binary identities, uh, gender queer, uh, gender fluid, gender fucker, gender pirates, and people who had even made up words to describe their own genders. I had one trans man, one trans woman, and one two-spirit person. My participants varied in terms of sexuality, including pan, poly, and kinky participants. 10 out of the 14 uh, had mental health issues that they identified to me in our interviews, including OCD, depression, anxiety, manic episodes or extreme mental states, and PTSD. And this is pretty reflective of the data that we have available about the prevalence of mental health issues in trans communities. And five indicated having other kinds of health issues, including fibromyalgia, a tick disorder, PCOS, endometriosis, connective tissue disorders, substance use issues, uh, hypothyroidism, et cetera. Most of these participants were working class, uh, students, artists, and frontline employees predominantly. So you can see that there's a bit of diversity here, but there's also a bit of um, kind of heterogeneity. A lot of these participants are similar in a lot of ways, but there's a bit of diversity, and that was intentional. The next slide is where you're going to see that I am, by training, a critical theorist. So bear with me if you are a public health person. This is about my analysis. So I use in my research the metaphor of choreography. I find this really useful because if we think about the fact that health institutions and health practitioners get to set the dance steps, that then people are expected to dance. You have to know the steps before you can improvise the steps. And so a lot of trans people are negotiating with healthcare systems that are setting the choreography. And they're doing those steps, but they're also improvising those steps. And those moments of improvisation are moments of resilience, are moments of making it up as you go along, of pushing back against the system that tells you there are particular ways that you ought to relate to your gender and that you ought to relate to your reproduction. My analysis is informed by uh, Scott's The Evidence of Experience, Again, this might lose you, but perfectly okay. I'm interested in how trans people's experiences and identities are constructed in relation to health systems. So it's not that there are trans people who negotiate with health systems. It's that transness is created in communication, in choreographed dances with health systems and structures. I'm interested in exposing the hegemonic structures of our social world with specific focus on gender and reproduction. I'm interested in unpacking the factors that have led to inequalities in trans people's gender and reproductive lives. And ultimately, I'm interested in uh, troubling notions of objectivity. I don't think there is such thing as objective research. I think that's a fallacy. My research is not objective. I am inherently biased because I am a participant in my own study, because I am a trans person with a reproductive life who is trying to navigate healthcare spaces that are not built for me. <laughs> 
And then I also experience my participants' retelling of their own experiences, all of which is kind of constructed uh, experience. The interview as a setting does not get us at truth. It gets us at a constructed version of truth. My research is informed by feminist post-structuralism. I'm interested in deconstructing binary oppositions like cis, trans, man, woman. I'm interested in the ways that social identities are performed and constructed via power. And I'm interested in Patty Lether's idea of getting lost, where getting lost and uncertainty open up possibilities for alternative perspectives. And this is where I am now in my dissertation research. I am currently so lost. <laughs> and trying to see that as productive and a good thing and this slide has brought you into my sense of uncertainty and being lost. So welcome. Consider it a place where we can op open up possibilities for alternative perspectives. So that's where I am now. I've conducted my field work. I've transcribed all of my interviews. I've done the really, really labor-intensive work of coding 28 interviews and 119 photographs. And I'm just starting to think about how I might write this up. What I'm going to be sharing with you today are excerpts from interviews and examples of photographs so that we can talk through some of the kinds of erasure, some of the barriers that trans people experience in reproductive and sexual health care spaces. The first is called informational erasure, and this is a definition that comes to us from an incredible scholar named Greta Bauer who tells us that informational erasure encompasses both a lack of knowledge regarding trans people and issues and the assumption that such knowledge doesn't exist even when it may. This erasure exists in research studies, curricula, textbooks, and in the information learned by or readily available to healthcare providers and policymakers. In short, when it comes to trans people's reproductive and sexual lives, we know almost nothing because we aren't asking. The research when it comes to trans people and health is primarily focused on gender-affirming treatments, HIV, and mental health. We simply aren't asking questions about sexual and reproductive health, and as a result, we don't know very much. But what we do know isn't actually getting into the hands of healthcare providers. And so oftentimes, trans people know more than the providers that they are seeing. The studies tell us that about 50% of trans people report having to educate their own health care providers about their health care issues. Just a note here as I move through the next slides that if the slide contains a photograph, I'm going to ask you not to photograph it. My participants have consented to having these photographs shared within this closed setting, but not beyond here. So photographs of just interview excerpts, please feel free to take pictures of. But if the slide contains an image, I'm going to ask you not to take pictures. So here are some examples of informational erasure. This comes from my master's thesis, and it's actually the only quote from my master's thesis that I'm going to share today. Jeanette is an abortion provider who actually has 25 years' experience working in abortion care. And here's what she says. Well, here's what got me, actually, what I hadn't thought of. I mean, I realize that your gender, that your transgender, doesn't have anything to do necessarily with your orientation, but the idea that a trans man would be having vaginal sex, and maybe even not just to get pregnant, I thought, wow, that would kind of be hard, wouldn't it? To think of yourself as male, and if you're still having vaginal sex, if you're still using your vagina for something, I mean, that too made me realize how limited my concept had been, how it is not all based on bodily disgust. So here's someone who is being confronted for the very first time with the realization that trans people might be using their sexed bodies and reproductive capacities in a way she had never imagined. And so for this abortion provider, the fact that a trans person might need an abortion was a revelation. She had no idea that that was a possibility. And when confronted with that possibility, she had this aha moment of, wow. We're going to talk in some slides to come about trans normativity. What Jeanette had internalized here was a very particular narrative about who trans people are, that they experience such deep bodily disgust or dysphoria or distress that they would never imagine using their body in sex or gendered or reproductive ways. That's something we're going to unpack in some slides to come. This is a quote and image from a participant in my study named Will, who describes their gender as infinity. 
Will says, I just didn't know anything about bodies, you know, until I met someone who is trans. I didn't really know about, like, say, sex. I didn't know about, like, you know, any of this stuff. I didn't really understand consent for the longest time. Just so many aspects that I ended up having to just, like, totally figure out by myself and go through my own growth for that. And then once I finally found my community, and yeah, like once I finally found queer community, it was like easier, but it was still still just like such a challenge to, you know, kind of like get any sort of stability with my reproductive health and stuff like that. Like when I started having issues with testosterone, my doctors didn't help for one fucking second. You know, like I definitely... You know, Clinic B helped me get back on my feet, right, once they figured out what was going on. But all the actual, you know, I guess my self-diagnosis, like figuring out what was actually going wrong, like I did that, right? I did that because I kept looking and thinking about it and, you you know, like charting things and making notes and being like, this is happening. I am not, you know, imagining this. And like, yeah. What Will is describing here is both a sense of informational erasure in their own life. They simply didn't have access to the kinds of information that they would need to make informed reproductive and sexual health decisions, but also being confronted with a healthcare system that couldn't help them. And so they had to do it themselves. The image on the right-hand side is actually a photograph of a painting that Will made. It is a painting, as they describe it, of the roots of a tree representing that in order to grow even a little, that's the amount of work that you have to put in to your healthcare providers so that you can flourish. You need to do all of that work first before your healthcare providers can help you, and then you can consequently grow. I thought it was a beautiful metaphor and really demonstrates the impact of informational erasure on trans people's lives. And then the final example here. So after Ollie was born, the three of us ended up working together and forming Birthing Beyond the Binary and sort of like brought my background in a sexual health and community education facilitation and their background in doula and midwifery stuff and transness and queerness. And we brought it all together and, you know, started offering trans-specific prenatal education through online teaching because that was what I would have liked to have accessed and it didn't exist, so we made it up. So here's people who are literally creating resources for healthcare providers to help fill some of the gaps. And this was completely unpaid labor being done by trans people based on their own experiences in order to address some of the inequities that we have in the way that we conduct research and the way that we educate um, upcoming nurses and doctors. The second barrier is institutional erasure, connected to informational erasure, and this definition also comes from Greta Bauer. This occurs through a lack of policies to accommodate trans identities or bodies, including the lack of of knowledge that such policies are even necessary. This is actualized in several ways. The possibility of trans identities can be excluded from the outset in bureaucratic applications such as texts and forms. Broadly speaking, trans people seeking health care are often faced with the acute realization that many providers are not familiar with or willing to accept the possibility of trans identities, which impacts both the availability and quality of care. The definition goes on from there. And here are a few examples of this. Elliot tells us, quote, yeah, then I went and had a pap test and my doctor's office called me and said they bounced at billing and it was my responsibility to sort it out because the doctor needed to get paid. So Elliot has an X on their health card. And a result of that X, the uh, payment schedule in the province of BC rejected the billing. Because you need to have an F on your health card to have a pap smear. And without an F, the computer system doesn't know what to do with you. And in this case, the onus to fix this, quote, problem was placed on Elliot, the patient, the client. And Elliot was able to get this rectified. But unfortunately, the very next person who has an X or an M or something else on their identity document is going to have their pap smear rejected. And so this is for all kinds of healthcare that we deliver. We have gendered billing codes. And those gendered billing codes are examples of institutional erasure. We're simply not prepared for the fact that trans people exist, that some people with Ms on their health cards have cervixes, have vulvas. That's not something that our computer systems, that our information systems are ready for. 
And then here we have Deacon, a gender fluid person, who says, I mean, even the when I went to the health clinic that does all the trans and gender affirming, all that stuff, they um the nurse went to put my stuff in the system and she was like, I'm like really sorry, I have to put in as, as put it in as one gender or another. It's just the program. So here, even in a space that is designed with the intention of being trans inclusive, we have trans people coming up against information systems that don't know what to do with us. And so again here, Deacon had to choose one gender or another despite identifying as a gender fluid person so that the computer could recognize them. And then here we have Eli, this is another long one, so bear with me. Yeah, I would, I would you know, Oh, this was after I asked if they would recommend the pelvic pain clinic at BC Women's Hospital. I would, I would, you know, with the caveat being that, like, my surgeon was great. She was great. And, you know, the pelvic pain clinic is at BC Women's Hospital, and it can, their understanding, I mean, their website, their waiting room, like, everything is just so, like, women, fertility, and it, it's frustrating. I mean, I, for my first appointment, one of my appointments after the surgery, you have to go and just get checked out. I was the first one, and I, when I was like still post-surgery, and it was, you know, a few months later, and I was just sitting there in the rating room, and I was the only person, and I was wearing, you know, like a big jacket, I guess. And for whatever reason, the nurse came in to get the next patient, who had to be me, because there was no one else in the waiting room, assuming that I was not the patient. And I had to get her, um, like, are you looking for me? And she was like, I'm looking for, because she was like, you're waiting for someone, right? And I said, no, like, I'm waiting. Like, I'm waiting for a doctor. I'm the patient here. And so it, I think, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this area. So here's a person who had had a hysterectomy following endometriosis, was at the pelvic pain clinic, where people knew that they were trans. They had already thought that they had done the legwork of letting people know who they were. And the nurse couldn't fathom that this person who didn't look like a woman sitting in the waiting room could possibly be the patient. And this nurse actually came and went like three or four times while the patient was like, hello, it's me. So there's a third example of this kind of informational erasure. Let's move on now to some of the uh, itties, cisnormativity, heteronormativity. If you're unfamiliar, cis-normativity is a combination of a variety of assumptions that we make. First, we assume that all people are sexed as male or female, which simply isn't true. There are intersex people, and we do atrocious things to intersex people in order to shore up this idea that there are only two sexes. Sex is simply much more complicated than that. We assume that there are only two genders, man and woman. And even when we think about trans people, we assume that there are only two genders there too, trans women and trans men. And we assume that sex and gender ought to line up in very predictable ways. That someone who is assigned male at birth is going to grow up to be a boy and then a man. We assume cisgender people as the default, and then transgender people are the exception, the anomaly, sometimes the aberration, sometimes the problem, and so this is an entire system or a, a, a kind of structure on which we have built governments, laws, our health institutions, our education institutions. And so we can see cisnormativity at work in a lot of places. Related to that is heteronormativity. So we similarly expect people to be straight by default. And when people aren't straight, it's, ooh, that's different, which is built on a foundation of cisnormativity, right? The two are connected. And then as a result of both of these, we've created gendered spaces. Um, this image you can take a photograph of. It's not from my participants. It's from a silo painter from Australia. And I just thought it was perfect because here we have something that I think really exemplifies the way that we deliver a lot of health care. We have the men's health sector and the women's health sector. And they are separate and siloed from one another. And they are coded as being for men or for women in very interesting ways. And there's very little room for trans people here. Because if a trans woman needs an STBBI test that includes a penile swab, she has to go to the men's health space. And if a trans man needs a pap smear, he has to go to the women's health space. And there's no room for non-binary people here. Because again, we assume that gender is binary, that everyone fits into the box of man or woman. And so when we start to think critically about who trans people are and what bodies we live in, this silo burns to the ground. And that's the anarchist in me that would like to just light a little match and burn it to the ground. 
Here are some examples of cis heteronormativities and gendered space from my dissertation. Again, this is a photograph of a participant, so I'll ask you not to share it. This is Carter, who says, um, it was hard, like being the only guy in the gynecological, gynecology ward. Um, kind of just, you know, being looked at, you know, differently. Um, being forgotten about. So after Carter um, had bottom surgery, um, specifically a hysterectomy, they were in a private room, which they had requested. They were not being segregated, which is nice, because that does happen. But then they were simply forgotten about for like a day and a half. No one fed them. No one checked on them. And they chalk that up to the fact that they were a guy on the gynecology ward. People just looked right past them as though they weren't there. And this is because of the way we gender these spaces. The expectation and the assumption is that everyone there is a woman, and that if you're not a woman, if you're in that space, you couldn't possibly be the client. Here's a quote from Rowan, who is a non-binary trans person, mm -hmm. discussing um, what it was like donating sperm. So yeah, I went to the fertility clinic and we had a long discussion with the physician about the options and what you know we could do with the sperm later on. But thankfully I didn't have to give other samples because they hated the process of doing it. It was so counter to, it was so like wrapped up in the binary, like heteronormativity. And um, it was funny because the room I was in was like, there were like rooms with like donations or like I interject specimen collection. Yeah, specimen collection. Like chair, like a dark room. It was so small, like probably five feet by five feet, just like a tiny TV, a little, or a tiny room, little TV screen on the wall, and porn, mag porn magazines. And there was one only like, obviously the, the room was designed for like men. And you know, based around the binary, and like I said, heteronormativity, because it was all straight porn, except for one, ma one magazine, and like, you know, 20 magazines. So this is a person who was assigned male at birth, who is non-binary, who's not a trans woman, although this, this fertility space seemed to kind of understand trans women and assumed that they were a trans woman, even though they are not. And it was coded not only with gender, but with heterosexuality. Only straight, gay, like straight men's magazines available in the room. Um, Rowan has deep reproductive desires and was willing to put up with this experience for the sake of being able to for preserve their fertility. What about trans normativity? Maybe you've heard of cis normativity, but trans normativity is a new one. It's a word that actually only I encountered maybe a year ago for the first time, and I had one of those kind of like paradigm shift aha moments. This is a quote from uh, an article that I have forthcoming where I say, trans people are held accountable to a specific set of binary and medicalized standards where what is at stake is being deemed legitimate in the eyes of the law, medical providers, and journalists, among others. Trans people who do not or cannot identify in binary ways and who do not or cannot adhere to a medical model of transition have their very identities questioned, challenged, or outright rejected. We use cisgender people as the model of normalcy against which we measure trans people. So we assume two things about trans people when we think about them at all. We assume that they are either trans men or trans women, that it's about moving from one fixed gender position to the other, the idea being that there are only two. And we assume that trans people, all of us, will or at least ought to want to desire medical transition so that we can match our insides to our outsides. It's this whole born in the bon wrong body trope that you've probably heard about. It's important to remember that that is true for some people but it is not true for all of us. That narrative came from a very particular place. It came from psychiatrists and endocrinologists and surgeons writing at the beginning of the, 19th, or the 20th century till now. They wrote the story and they hold us to it as if it is gospel. It is not. Here are some examples of transnormativity at work. This is Noah, a non-binary masculine of center mixed race person who says, I was kind of like, when I was in for my pulmonary embolism, there was a nurse that assumed I was a man. And was like, it took me a while to realize that. Because I, like, I was like, oh, do I need to have this conversation with this person about like, how I don't identify as either? I mean, like, I was kind of like, okay, take one for the team. Yep, I'm your first, I'm your first male person in the maternity ward. Because like, they stuck me there because the hospital was really full. So I got put back in the maternity laughing, which was like, so I was just like, yep, yep. Yeah, no, we're all really brave. Yep. <laughs> So here we see transnormativity at work 
the assumption was that this person wasn't a woman, that they must be a man, that those are the only options. But Noah is not a man. And so had to negotiate whether in this moment of post-birth pulmonary embolism, they had the capacity to educate their nurse on the fact that they were not actually a man, that they don't call themselves mama or daddy. Um, and ultimately, Noah decided to just kind of go with it and to let themselves be misgendered. And in fact, part of what we see here is this narrative of bravery, that when trans people do regular things, normal everyday stuff, we're so brave for doing so, which is a way of kind of fetishizing and romanticizing trans people's experiences. And this, in this case, what Noah was brave for doing was tolerating misgendering for the sake of care. Uh, it wasn't simply brave that they had decided to have a child and that they were dealing with a, a complication. It was brave that they ultimately decided to not take this teaching moment because we're often forced to engage in those teaching moments, even when we're in the middle of a medical crisis. And here's another example from Eli. I went and did all the tests. I came back and saw the original doctor that I'd been recommended, and she was very distrustful of me. It's hard for me to understand exactly what happened. I had guessed that maybe um, she was sort of like put down unofficially as like a trans-friendly doctor, and then there were a lot of people going to her being like, I have pelvic pain, nudge, nudge, you know? And when it was harder, because uh, this was five years ago, and it's easier now in some ways, but it's not always been such a clear path for folks who do elect to get hysterectomy for gender affirmation. And I had thoughts that like maybe she just felt overused in that. And she saw me and she just felt like she was like, I know what this person is doing and I'm not having it. And she was so angry at me. And she was like, I don't even think you have endometriosis. I was like, well, I have the film from my surgery. Like you can look at it. Um, and she wouldn't. She just like, I wish I remembered the conversation better. I like, I was... Uh, I was like not having the like the two of us were yelling at each other in the room and it was so hurtful and she was she was telling me she was like I will not sign off on this surgery I don't even think you have that um, like okay and she like said all of these horrible things and so I left because it was really I mean it was super delegitimizing and I've been dealing with this pain since like I was 15 years old and to have this person be like that's not real because of what you look like so I think you're trying to game the system by pretend. So here we have a person who had very legitimate pain documented by films and multiple screenings. And yet because of the potential that they might have been a trans person trying to quote, dupe the system, this, per this provider was enraged, completely distrustful of Eli and completely de delegitimizing of the pain that Eli was actually experiencing. And then finally, we have uh, Logan, who is an agender person, who says, and I mean, I think it was just, uh, I think it was because most professionals I was dealing with thought that I was probably actually some kind of crazy and not actually legitimately trans. And like probably if they saw me now, they would feel like they were right. You know, like, um, and yeah, I think it was because they were really, well, you were pregnant before, probably you'll get pregnant again. And yeah, I think that whatever the narrative is, I don't really know what it is. So that was definitely impacting the way that professionals were dealing with me and being like, definitely you're going to have more kids. Definitely you're going to want to detransition and be able to breastfeed and get pregnant and all these things. And so we're going to like make recommendations based on that assumption and that will be true for you. So here we have this narrative of detransition tied up in narratives of reproduction. The idea being that if Logan wanted to become pregnant and chest feed again, that that would be incompatible and incon inconceivable with a trans identity. But as a result, providers were patronizingly making healthcare decisions on Logan's behalf that would set them up to quote, detransition so that when they inevitably got pregnant again, um, they wouldn't kind of be at fault. So again, we see the entanglement of gender and reproduction here. And then finally, we have repronormativity. And I provide you with two definitions. This refers to a paradigm that is limited to legitimizing state-sanctioned heteronormative acts of reproduction specifically through the patriarchal heteronormative family and service to this production of the heteropatriarchal nation states. 
And conversely, uh, somehow reproduction comes to be regarded as more inevitable and natural than heterosexuality. That is to say, repronormativity, the materialization and maternalization of female identity, remains in the closet even while heteronormativity has stepped more into the light of the theoretical and political day. Essentially what that means is we expect reproduction to be inevitable for people who are assigned female at birth. We give little girl children baby dolls and talk about how cute they're going to be when they have a child one day. It is seen as inconceivable that someone might not want to have children. That is completely unfathomable to us. And it's something that we affix in particular to female assigned bodies. Men can or cannot you know, be sperm providers and might not be fathers, that's fine. But women ought to want to be moms. That's your purpose. That's the reason why you were born into the body that you were born into, right? And so we build that into our healthcare delivery, this expectation and assumption that women are inherently reproductive entities. And that's the very point. And then we protect relationships, specifically heterosexual relationships, that have procreative potential. We don't want to mess with the potential that someone might one day use their uterus to have a baby. And this is caught up in colonization, in the creation of nation states. We want the right people to have children so that we can po populate the planet with good people like us. It's a really problematic narrative and something that cisgender women negotiate all of the time. Here are two examples. Logan tells us, that the, I never understood that, and I still don't really. But when I was like 18 and had a baby, random people, like strangers, whoever, would ask me like, so when are you having another one? And I'm like, why are you fucking saying that to an 18-year-old? Are you like being an asshole right now? And I think it's actually just as a part of the supportive narrative maybe in the straight world to be able to be like, oh, when are you having your next kid? Because you're obviously like on that journey or whatever. But I remember also being like so confused, like, no? What? Definitely. Not for a while, if ever. And so we, here we have a teen parent who was being asked simultaneously, like, you were too young for that baby, but also, when are you having your next one? And then finally, we have uh, an excerpt from a conversation that Huxley had with their partner. Huxley says, feeling anxious, the receptionist said they were going to issue me an IUD. If that is true, I'm going to lose it. I'm still waiting to see the doctor. I don't want a fucking IUD. I want to be sterilized. IUDs are horseshit. They are painful to insert and take out, and they are not 100% effective and can cause miscarriages. And Huxley's partner replies, they can't just issue you that. That's bullshit. Don't let them try that and sway you on that. And Huxley replies, I'll freak the fuck out if they do. So this is a person who had been asking for some kind of sterilization, tubal ligation, hysterectomy, they did not care, for over 10 years, and was being told time and time again, well, you're too young. Well, what if your next boyfriend wants babies? And no matter how many times they said that this was something they absolutely needed in order to feel good walking in the world, they were denied. And here they were at an appointment where they expected to have a conversation about tubal ligation or about hysterectomy, and someone had marked down that the appointment was actually an IUD insertion, which caused incredible mental distress for this human being. Ultimately, I'm happy to report Huxley was approved for a tubal ligation, and they threw a party. <laughs> um, but it was not without them, A, doing a lot of work and self-advocacy, and B, not telling anyone that they were trans. Because they worried that if they disclosed that they were trans, that then their desire for sterilization, their desire for infertility, would be kind of caught up in these cis, repro, heteronormative, transnormative narratives that I've just unpacked for you. So they intentionally concealed this very important aspect of who they were, just so that they could, after 10 years, get the thing that they had been demanding. So to conclude, my research, my activism, this presentation tells us about various entanglements. Cis, hetero, trans, and repronormativities are all mixed up together, and all mixed up together in the way that we deliver healthcare. You might have noticed when I was giving you an example of cis normativity that there are actually elements of repronormativity there that actually the examples I've provided don't fit neatly into any of these boxes because these things are all entangled together. And this entanglement contributes to the informational and institutional erasures. 
and are manifested in the way that we deliver care in gendered silos. Sexual and reproductive health care are distinct, but they are also entangled. And if we consider trans people's sexual and reproductive lives, we are prompted to critically question the way that we and our society link sex to gender, to reproduction, to parenting. We tie them together in a neat little line, and then trans people step in and mess up that line. Gratefully, we love it, it's fun. Um, but then we're confronted with people who are messing up our understanding of things and the way that we have been delivering care for as long as we can remember. And that is what frames trans people as the problem, because they would dare mess up the line of how we have tied these things neatly together. And then again, that final kind of analytical, critical theory brain of mine is interested in the way that trans the idea of who trans people are is an identity that is entangled with expectations and assumptions about sexual and reproductive life, which are reified in our healthcare encounters. So we have an idea of who trans people are based on how they ought to relate to their sexual and reproductive bodies, and then we measure whether they are authentically trans based on whether they match up to our measurements. And with that, thank you. so much, AJ. Wonderful work. So we have about 15 minutes for some questions and discussion, and really happy to open it up to the floor. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, this is a very powerful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question about, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with puberty blockers. Mm -hmm. So um, therefore, like, you know, for example, like people they want to block puberty, basically. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how common it is, but I've listened to podcasts like talking about the system in the UK, and often like the reason for rejecting uh, to uh, to administer to to give the patient a puberty blocker is what if you let the, the concern for maybe it all harms your information system. Okay, okay. All right. <laughs> like, that could be an emergency. I don't know. Um, so, so one of the arguments against it is what if mm -hmm. like, you as a, a teenager you're not ready and you might change your mind but then you won't have your reproductive capacity. Mm -hmm. Have you worked with anything, any like any, yeah. Anything like that? So the question was about puberty blockers, which are um, oftentimes given to prepubescent folks in order to delay puberty such that they can then make kind of better decisions about their lives and not have to go through a puberty that might be distressing. And the question was around whether those puberty blockers, there's sometimes hesitation about prescribing them over the fear that maybe this will have negative impacts on someone's fertility and that a young person maybe isn't ready to make those kind of long-term decisions about what their future reproduction or fertility might look like. So puberty blockers do not have a negative impact on fertility. Um, all they do is block puberty. So when someone stops taking a puberty blocker, the puberty that their body was going to go through anyway based on its assigned sex will simply occur as per normal. Um, so that hesitation is actually a fear that's not based on any empirical science. Um, in fact, the worst thing to do would be to force a young person who's experiencing distress to go through a puberty that they're not emotionally prepared for because of this repronormative narrative. Because what if this 14-year-old doesn't yet know that, of course, they're going to want babies because everyone wants babies. <laughs> um, and ultimately, we can't protect people from regret. We all live with regrets. I have regrets. You probably have regrets. But we can do is protect young people from suicide. And that's what we do with puberty blockers. And so if we're worried more about someone regretting a decision later and less about their ending them life, their life today, then we need to interrogate that. So puberty blockers ought to be prescribed. Um, they ought to be prescribed perhaps alongside therapy and counseling, but I am a firm advocate that everyone needs therapy and counseling. Um, and by trained providers who are not going to kind of reify these notions of like, well, maybe one day you're going to want to be a mommy. Uh, um, but yeah, that's, does that answer your question? Um, 
I was just wondering if you were if you are ever consulted by any clinic that provides puberty blockers to people about um, like for your service about trying language? No, so I haven't had anyone working in, the, in with youth in particular um, ask for my services, but there is a scholar named Jake Pine, P-Y-N-E, um, whose activism and advocacy work is all about youth and puberty blockers. So um, he is from Toronto, but he's readily, readily available by Skype and otherwise, and has written a lot of really interesting um, scholarly research on puberty blockers and young people. So that would be my suggestion of who you might want to reach out to. Mm -hmm. Kate? Uh, yeah, so uh, first of all, thank you so much, Adrian, for the presentation. Um, really amazing work. Um, and I, I guess I'm wondering in the, your master's work, which I think is also a really amazing example of anyone doing work that leads to policy and advocacy, um, have you had much follow-up, so it's like amazing to see that taken up by guidelines, you said in Canada and the U.S. Mm -hmm. Have you, do you know if there's any like evaluation, like I'm curious about how you know, the mm -hmm. guidelines in this practice um, and whether, whether you've been able to work with any abortion clinics in terms of how that's rolling out. Yeah, so that's a great question. So for folks who didn't hear, it was about whether there's been any kind of evidence to support the impact that the trainings and things have done so that we know whether the policies are actually making change on the ground. And in my own personal consulting business, no. Um, but I was actually just asked to um, be a partner on a grant in the United States where they're doing just that. Um, they're proposing to deliver um, 16 to 20 in-person training sessions, 16 to 20 virtual or webinar sessions, and then as a control uh, medication abortion training with nothing about trans people specifically, so that we can actually evaluate which kind of intervention method is most effective and how we ought to be investing our money when it comes to training. I'm a firm advocate that in-person is best, um, but I might be biased because I get paid to do in-person <laughs> training. Um, but the idea here is that, yeah, we need, we need evidence to, to tell us what is the best way to teach people these things. Is it enough that I do a presentation and I provide you with some definitions? Or do you need to walk through your clinic with someone standing beside you so you can think about, like, oh, yeah, that poster on the wall and, oh, yeah, that, that kind of space. Like, what is the best way to actually institute change here? Um, so it's kind of an implementation science piece that hopefully this project will get funded and I'll be able to answer your question in like two years' time. And I guess, I guess is there, was there, is that for that project or do you know, is there, I'm curious about the experience of actually trans patients going through that project. Like, mm -hmm. It's like, cause I, I guess there's always like clinics and practice and then how well is that being implemented as and how much, yeah. how across the board that thing is So from patient perspective. Yeah, so from a patient perspective, at the moment there are only two peer-reviewed scholarly articles written in English about trans people's experiences of abortion, two. <laughs> That's it. Uh, there's a third one coming. <laughs> um, so the short answer is we, we don't know because we aren't asking. Yeah. But we could, we, we could ask. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I have a related question. Yeah, well, so so the, the amazing research that you've just shared with us is it's so powerful and it's so compelling. This information is really, you know, we want to see this being implemented, mm -hmm. you know, within the healthcare system. Even, I mean, the master's work and that knowledge translation mm -hmm. example you just shared is amazing in the context of abortion services. A lot of the information you've shared from your PhD obviously goes even broader than that. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I'm curious to hear a little bit if you've had dialogue with you know, any of the kind of, you know, healthcare folks here and kind of what, and if any, like, knowledge translation plans exist for your PhD work mm -hmm. that you shared with us here today. Yeah, so the knowledge translation pieces for my PhD are going to be at least in part participant guided. So I'm allowing my participants to tell me what they would like to do with the stuff, that the beautiful information that they've shared with me. Uh, and so one thing we're, we want to do is the photo exhibition because obviously this project involved a photography piece. Um, I have my own plans. Um, one thing I'm doing at the moment is working with the Women's Health Research Institute to trouble the idea of the Women's Health Research Institute. <laughs> um, and so uh, that the kind of like broader macro pieces is something that uh, I definitely have in mind. In terms of my consultancy business, I go where I'm asked. I don't I don't recruit or solicit um, clients. Um, I am trying to finish my my PhD, uh, and so I don't go out of my way to try to like advertise this work that I do. But if folks are interested in having 
someone come in and train their staff or think about their policies or audit their website, that's definitely work that I do. Um, and I want to recognize also the incredible work that TransCare BC does here. And in fact, a large number of my clients tell me that if it weren't for TransCare BC, that things would be even worse. Um, and that British Columbia uh, in the Canadian national landscape has a reputation of doing things right. Um, and yet even though we're steps closer because of TransCare BC, we have a lot farther to go and we ought not to rely on one group of dedicated folks to fix the entire system. Um, we ought to be kind of engaged in the conversation ourselves. Um, and kind of spreading around the labor so that we're not always going, hey, TransCare, fix this problem. Hey, TransCare, who do you have on your roster? Um, because although they're an incredible resource, they are also a completely overworked resource. Um, so yeah, recognizing that um, we are doing good things, but there's, there's more to come. Thanks, Shira. Uh, May Ling and then Adrian. Okay. If you, yeah? Yeah, let me I just wanted to thank you for your research. I often come to hear about how to support trans people at lunchtime lectures in this room, and this is the first time I've actually felt a reflection of my lived experience in the mm -hmm. work. Um, and these things that your participants have told us are so normal inside the trans community. Um, I particularly like how you've made a focus um, on pointing out that the status quo is disordered and that there's this tremendous harm of doing nothing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to comment, but thanks. Thanks, Adrian. I will just leave that and make it feel good in my heart. <laughs> um, at the back here. I'm um, yeah, also really want to hear the things that's been, I uh, really appreciate this presentation. I feel like I learned a lot and um, it really resonated with me. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I was kind of curious, because I know that his, like, the historical context with um, reproductive health care, and specifically in regards to access and sterilization. There's been a, 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 a racial difference where like white or perceived able-bodied folks um, often have a much harder time accessing sterilization procedures, whereas people of color or people who are um, more physically recognized as having a disability, um, are, it, sterilization is often forced upon them or coerced. And I was wondering if this um, came up in your research or if you saw that there was kind of parallel with yeah, great question. Um, did everyone hear that? I know since they're at the back of the room, I'm hoping. Okay, perfect, great. Um, so it didn't come up in my study. Uh, Huxley was one of the only participants who spoke about a desire for sterilization specifically, and they are a white genderqueer person. So despite their whiteness, they had huge barriers and obstacles. Um, that the prevalence of forced sterilization among indigenous people of color, disabled folks, et cetera, is an absolutely real and ongoing thing. Um, I actually wrote a paper about the state sanctioned sterilization of trans people um, and put it within the context of the history of eugenic strategies that we've employed uh, in the past as well as today. So if you're unfamiliar in many places in the world, including in British Columbia until 2015, if you wanted the state to recognize you as a man or a woman, you needed to undergo surgery to demonstrate that you were permanently unable to reproduce like the sex that you were assigned. So if you wanted the state to recognize you as a man, you needed to prove that you could never get pregnant ever, ever again. And so we had state-sanctioned sterilization happening here. Um, we were embedding it in vital statistics acts and coding it in really pretty language. But the idea was that if you wanted to be a man, men don't get pregnant. If you wanted to be a woman, women don't produce sperm. And the fertility preservation technologies that are available to us are so cost prohibitive that it is largely white trans people who can access them. And so we have trans people of color, in particular trans women of color, who are the most disadvantaged here. And so it is reproductive injustice that we have trans women of color who, A, aren't allowed to live long enough to consider having a rich reproductive life, and then B, are systematically, financially, and economically denied access to reproductive technologies that might allow them that possibility. So that's a long convoluted answer that kind of doesn't get at the very specifics of your question, but is a kind of broader context that I hope speaks to at least to the, the idea that you're getting at. Thank you. Any final burning questions before we wrap up? All right. Well, just want to extend a warm round of applause again for our speakers. Thank you so much.